All right, we will start now. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. So we don't have that many people here, less than 10. Maybe others will join in late. But I think we should start, uh, uh, try to end this, let's say, before tw uh, 12 o'clock. Okay, I will go through uh, some presentation, which is uh, related to the questions that is posted here also. And then after that, if you guys have any questions, can put in uh, your questions into Slido. Not just questions, uh, sometimes if you have any topic that you want to discuss, uh, if you have uh, any viewpoint you want to share, um, that's also uh, okay. Uh, highly welcome. So just let me know in the Slido or... I can't monitor the chat group at the same time now because I have too many screens open at the same time already. So uh, let's start. Okay, I'll, I'll just go through uh, some presentations of the economic, uh, not so much on the economic outlook. Like, it's more to look at the current uh, market situations now uh, or, or the economic situations and just make some judgment on current situation. And hopefully that will be helpful for us to like look forward, let's say three or six months. Uh. So the last time we had uh, all this TCSS chat was I think four months ago. I have stopped posting video on, on YouTube for four months. So I, I think the things has been happening in, in, in the past four months uh, and the situation is not that great, but we will look it, into it in more details here. So the first slide I'm trying to show here is just the Fed fund rate. So I think for those who haven't, let's say like you, you, you haven't investing for a long time, uh, even the Fed fund rate itself is like an um, interesting concept. Like you, you never heard of this, this, uh, this variable, right? But... I think since early this year, there's all this inflation fear and then people start to talk about Fed fund rates and then how what's the implication and so on. Uh, as of now, the Fed fund rate is uh, usually it's a range. Uh, so 2.25% to 2.5%. Uh, I think Federal Reserve, they will target the rate within this band, meaning that if it is outside, right, they will do some uh, open market operations just to bring the Fed fund rate into, into this range. Uh. So this Fed fund rate, right, is, it will serve as like a base uh, funding cost, uh, almost like a interbank rate. So, and if this rate increase, right, you, you can imagine that other, other funding costs will also be impacted as well, including, let's say, if any companies, they want to issue bonds, right? Uh, if the interbank rates is already like 2 to 2.25 to 2.5%, then of course, all these corporates, they have to uh, raise bonds at a higher cost, higher cost, right? So this is the implication sum. So you can look at the rates, right? You can, I mean, if we just look at history, right? Uh, used to be like in the 80s, it used to be very high because the inflation was very high uh, back then. And then uh, since then, the Fed fund rate has been trending down. And last time during uh, global financial crisis, the Fed fund rates already pushed down to like effectively 0% here. And they, they can't push it further. That's why there's all this quantitative easing and so on. And then around 2016 onwards or around 2018, this period, right, the market is good. And then hence, um, they started with the quantitative tightening and then the Fed fund rates also, they, they try to hike it until I think early 2019, uh, they saw that the market is already like, uh, already cooled down and then there's some sign of recession. Uh, then they started to lower down the Fed fund rates, right? And then it's un until 2020 during COVID, they pressed it down to zero again and restarted the QE and started from early this year because of the inflation is really, really high. Later, we'll look at some inflation numbers. I think these are all, if you look at the news, you, you have seen that now, but just an uh, uh, overview of uh, situations just to give you some sense. Now. Then after a couple of rate hikes, right, I think they hiked a couple of rounds of 75 basis point. Now we are at 2.25% to 2.5%. So this is Fed fund rate. In terms of the moving forward, right, the projections, right, uh, I think in the past, I've shared this before. You can look at the um, Fed Fund futures. This is implied from the derivative markets. Uh. So you can see that by end of this year, uh, we should be around, let's say, 3.5 to uh, 4% around this range. So this is, uh, this is, this number is based on the derivative market, meaning that whoever don't think this is the right one, uh, for example, you think that the Fed Fund rate should be, let's say, 4% by end of the year, right? You can always trade it. So this one is like, uh, it, it reflect what the market uh, participants think where the Fed fund rate is going to be. Um, this is an uh, implied rate. And the right-hand side, right, this is the dot plot. Uh, so the dot plot is actually uh, 
during the FOMC meetings, they will ask all the Fed governors, like, uh, where, where do you think where the Fed fund rate is uh, by end of 2022, 2023, and 2024. So this is their opinions. So this one got nothing to do with the left, left hand side. Sometimes they also uh, like deviates, uh, for example, like uh, the market already believed that the Fed fund rate will be a lot higher, but then the dot plots, sometimes they haven't like uh, openly um, like voiced their opinion on where the Fed fund rate is going to be. Sometimes it will deviate, uh, but if we look at the period, let's say uh, by end of the year, right, you see here is around 3.5 to let's say 4%, right? This one is slightly lower, around uh, 3.25% to 3.5%. The deviation is, isn't that big. Um, I would say actually quite close. Um, and let's say, I think September meetings, they might revise the top plot again. Then we can see that all this number might be uh, adjusted upward. Uh. So s sometimes there's lack uh, of this top plot because they only do these uh, revisions uh, quarterly. Whereas for... For the Fed Fund futures, essentially every day traded, you will see this number keep changing every day now. So what I want to say here is that currently, although we are only at 2.25%, right? Uh, but by end of the year, we probably will have another 75 basis point hike uh, coming September and then another 50 basis point hike uh, by end of the year. So at least this is, I, I would say I, I agree with the assessment here. Usually over the short term, right, they are quite accurate one. But over the longer term, let's say uh, by mid of 2023, whether it will still be at 3.75%, right? Like this uh, expectation, whether it's correct or not, uh, we, we really don't, don't know. Let's say inflations keep going up 9, 10%, right? All these numbers will be adjusted uh, upward. Uh. So this is Fed Fund Rate, Fed Fund Futures. Um, then just a revision, I think this one everyone knows uh, because, you know, there's so much uh, news coverage, right? Talking about inflation. Uh, when inflation should up to 9.1% is really scary. Uh, this is like broke the 40-year high, 40-year records. And you can see the last time it was this high was uh, in the 80s, right? So all this inflation used to be a problem uh, where it is too low. Now it become too high. So th th that's why all this interest rate hike uh, is required to cool down the economy and cool down the inflation. We, we got one uh, result which is uh, slightly better, 8.5%. That's why the market rallied uh, for a while, right? And then now sh started to go down again, um, also because of inflation fears and recession fears. Now. So this is inflation. And recently also, uh, I think Jerome Powell also gives speech during the Jackson Hole meetings, right? And then I think he... He draw a lot of per or some learnings from the uh his from the history. Basically, he, what he I mean, my my main takeaway from that uh speech is that inflation itself, right? If you don't hike the interest rate enough to cool it down, once the inflation is high and stay high for for a long period of time, and all these businesses, right, they will build in high inflation into their projection. Then they have no choice but to hike their price. For example, if you look at um, Tesla, I think this is a good example, right? They they know that whatever cars that they sell today, they are not going to deliver immediately, right? So they will deliver the cars, let's say, uh, a couple of months or even six months uh, down the road, right? So let's say if they sell at uh, 40000 now and then by the time they deliver, uh, the input cost is all getting higher, right? So it's actually that they are not making money if the inflation keep going up and up and input costs uh, keep going up, right? So they will have to hide the price in first uh, in anticipation of inflation in the future. So if everyone do that, right, then inflation will just uh, escalate and, and very hard to control. So... They really fighting with inflation now, so that's why all the uh, rate hikes is coming like uh, in a huge magnitude. Uh. So go back to this side, right? You can see that the slope of the interest rate hike is different from uh, 2018. I think 2018 they still do like uh, 25 basis point uh, every meetings. Now it's like 75 basis point every meetings, right? So it's really a sharp increase. Uh. So that's uh, coming from from uh, Jerome Powell. And then second takeaway, right? I think second takeaway is more like. Um, I think market participants believe that, let's say they do, they hike interest rate now. And the moment if we see uh, growth slowing down and then they have some um, some some fear when it comes to uh, like GDP growth or unemployment, right? They believe that uh, Fed will 
pivot, meaning that they will stop hiking rates or they will just uh, lower the interest rate again. So this is the market participants when the interest rate or, or when the market started to have this mini rally. And then I think they, Jerome Powell, he just came out and said, no, he's not going to do that. Uh. So he think, he think that even if the economy slow down, but inflation stay high, he will just press on the interest rate high until the inflation go back down to like 2%. So if we see uh, further slowdown, right? So that is not going to uh, make them pivot. At least that's his key message. Uh. That's why after the meeting, I think the market also like dropped. Like all, all these messages are, you know, he, he's trying to like, um, trying to, how to say, uh, trying to give some expectations. Uh, like uh, don't expect too much. Like don't expect them to pivot that easily. So basically that's the message. Um, then let me continue first. Then after I finish the um, economic part, then if you have any questions, then we can open uh, for discussions. Uh -huh. The next one is uh, talking about inflation. Uh, I think, of course, everyone is guessing whether the uh, inflation number 8.5% last month, right? So we have every month we have new uh, data that coming up, right? Whether the inflation will slow down or whether it will just flat or whether it will escalate again, right? So I think that one, we really have to look at the commodity prices uh, or, or the, you know, what, what is, I think the, all these commodity prices is one of the uh, factor that causing inflation so high. If you look at the price, uh, commodity prices, I think it should up a lot around June period and then it has cooled down, right? And since then it's like zigzagging around uh, this region here. So I think this is not a picture that the central bank want to see. They really want, wanted to see that uh, prices cooling down further. Um, and if not, right, it will still continue to cause the inflation. The inflation is like more like a year over year kind of measurements, meaning that if you look at the period, if the commodity prices is here, right, uh, last year it is around this period, this uh, prices. So you always report a high inflation, right? As long as prices remain at this level. But uh, the good thing is that it's not like just a parabolic up. Now. There's some some cooling here. I think this is something that can um, give us some assurance that not to be too worried about. Uh. So if this one further cool down, I think uh, it will be a positive sign for the market. So this one is S&P GSCI um, index. So if you want to look at the uh, components, right, this I pull up from the Wikipedia. I think it's like seven, uh, sixty-two percent from energy and then sixteen percent from agri uh, agriculture. And these two are the one that we saw a huge price rally since beginning of the year, right? So energy, you know, oil price, and then agriculture is because of uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia. They are like um, all these exporters, right? So there's some impact there. So this is about the inflation. I think the next one, which I don't think that many people talk about is whether, you know, how to say, if we look at the market, right, what influence market is not just inflation. Of course, in the past, let's say six months, uh, inflation fear is the dominant one. But aside from inflation, right, the other angle is whether the growth rate is like uh, growing healthily or slowing down, right? Because if growth rate slow down too much, right, it will impact the un unemployment uh, as well. So this one, I think not many people is talking about, but uh, it, it is also showing some sign of like worry here. Lah. So if we want to know the leading indicators of growth, right? Actually, uh, this um, you composite PMI, I think the composite PMI made out of two. Lah. One is the manufacturing PMI, the other one is service uh, services PMI. Uh, the composite is just like the, uh, the sum of these two. Lah. So if you look at this uh, since beginning of the year, this is 2022, right? Uh, we already have like a consecutive, how many months, like five or six months uh, of slowing down. So I think this is really not a good picture. And, and if you look at the line, right? I think the line at 50 here, if it is below 50, it means uh, there's some sign of contractions. Uh. So if this one further, so, so down further, right? Uh, you will see that the unemployment rate uh, and GDP growth, uh, they, they all will be like, continue to slow down uh, in the coming months. Uh. So I think this is something that we should uh, keep an eye on. I think that's all on um, all this, you know, like market economic outlook. Um, 
things that I'm looking at. So just to put a summary, right, I would say that inflation is, is kind of like, don't know where's the direction. It could cool down or it could like continue to, to stay flat or it could even go up slightly, right? I, I really don't know. I think it seems that they are zigzagging based on this chart here. But in terms of the growth, uh, we are seeing some, some slowdown here. So overall, right, if you just look at the macroeconomic data, I would say that I am on the bearish side, but uh, I'm not Michael Burry, that kind of uh, bearish. Uh, I'm not saying that, okay, uh, market for sure will crash. This one, we actually don't know. Um, because all this, right, all this data that we are talking about, right, it's all public data, right? It's not just uh, we know about it. If we look at this data six months ahead, of course, uh, it's very helpful, but no one can see the future uh, so advanced, right? At least I, I, I myself, I don't know. So all this public data is available to everyone. Everyone is looking at this. So to a certain extent, they are kind of like embedded into current uh, prices, uh, current stock prices. So I think that's the thing. Um, so I'm on the bearish side, but not not like super bearish. Uh. So that, that's um, my question. Uh, my answer to this question, I think there's one question that asked me about uh, what's the outlook. Wow, suddenly so many questions here. So I hope I han answer that questions, uh, especially on this first one, the first questions, and it on the impact of QT that the US Fed is deploying now and the macroeconomic condition at least till the end of 2020, end of 2022. Oh, there's one thing I didn't comment on this, uh, which is the QT. So for those who don't know, right, QT is just a string, uh, the shrinkage of the uh, Fed balance sheet. And this is all well communicated, right? So we are expecting that the Fed will um, like, like let their bond matures by around, I think, one to two trillions. At least that's the plan. I think they will just do that at least till end of, um, let's say, next year. For the next 12 months, I think they will just execute it. Uh. So, and they are using the the Fed fund rates, uh, how many heights they want to do, right? Whether it's 75, 50 or 25, they, they will control that. Uh, but for the quantitative tightening, I think they, they already set up the plan and they will just follow the plan. Uh. So nothing crazy here. For those who are very worried of QT, right? I would say that you, you just uh, need to remember that this is not the first time that the Fed doing all this QT. The first round is actually uh, during 2016, 17, 18, that period. They already tried it once. Uh, it's just that the different comparing current period versus 2018 was that uh, the magnitude is a bit larger uh, right now because the they, they had a massive QE in 2020 and 2021, right? So they just want to uh, pay it down now. So the magnitude is different, but the mechanism is not so different. So please expect that the bond yield will continue to go up and then there should be some uh, cool down of the economy and also stock market. So don't, don't expect the stock market to moon so much. Uh, at least uh, I have strong conviction on that. Uh. Whether it will have a huge crash or not, uh, at least I don't think so. Uh, minor ad adjustment downward. Uh, okay, I, I think that one I, I already expected. Uh. So... Yep, that's my answer on the first question. I'll stop here just to see anyone have any questions or any, any viewpoint that you want to share here. Okay, don't make this become a solo <laughs> discussion now. Uh, but later, I think on the, on the, on the uh, single company discussion, maybe I will call in some names. Uh. So let's say if you are not able to speak, maybe you can just leave uh, some message in the group. Then uh, I, I will call up your names now. Uh. I saw some familiar names here, so we'll go do that. Okay, um, next one. Uh, yeah, Bunti is back. So yeah, uh, yeah, I'm back. So I hope that this uh, weekly TCSS, uh, hope that we can do this uh, consistently. I can't commit like every week, uh, but let's say if I'm free, you guys are free, then we just do it. Uh, try to like exchange some learnings, right? Uh, yeah, I think hopefully you like the show. <laughs> Uh, current investment portfolio and allocation. Okay, I think I don't have much to talk about, uh, but I will just share, you know, like my allocations. I think for those who follow my spreadsheet in the past, I have been updating it. Uh, I think this is also for my own tracking. It's not like I feel so happily <laughs> to, to like share to everyone, right? So keep, keep it to yourself. I think, uh, it just said, Okay, this is just for, for, for myself. I just look at the allocations. The reason why I have this, right, is just that 
you know, I, I see, always see myself like my portfolio just started, although this entire portfolio I've been building up since uh, late tw- night, uh, sorry, late 2017. So it's around, uh, around five years already. But I still prefer to see like, okay, it is still early in the process, uh, still building up. Hence, I try to keep a uh, balanced allocations across different companies. Um, the expectation is that, you know, like not all of them will work out. Uh, so this is my expectation. Some of them will actually like, you know, uh, not working out well, execution fail, and then they, their allocations should string over time. But out of all these names, except for the ETF, right, or all these single names, there will be companies that will be very successful over the next five to 10 years. So their allocations, right, should uh, become larger and larger. So the portfolio, it should concentrate over time just because the business is doing well. And also regularly, I'm still putting money uh, and building up the portfolio, right? So this is more like for my own tracking. Of course, if I see some names, let's say uh, if the prices uh, drop and then if I think that their fundamental is strong, so I'll buy more into it. So um, yeah, I will u- just use this for my own tracking. Now. So this is the allocations. If you have any questions on any companies, right, I can share a little bit more. It's just that, you know, I haven't done a lot of preparation. Now, so if you just ask me, I'll just randomly like like tell you what's my thought uh, on top of my head rather than some 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 uh, preparations. Though. So I'll stop here first, see anyone have any question. All right, no questions. Um, thoughts of allocation to short-term bonds for investment versus equities or continue DCA? I think this questions, right, it really depends on the stage, your, your current stage, because, you know, I, I, I do this show, right? I don't know who is watching, right? It could be someone who is, let's say, like 25 years old, just started working, or it could be someone who is already like 65 years old, already retired, have like, let's say, um, 500k cash in the account and then it's really hard to give uh, uh, opinions on like a generic question without knowing the profile of the person now. so i would say that this question about how much to put into bonds versus equities right uh on at least for the long-term kind of uh view is that first thing we will ask is not about like how the market outlook you know market outlook tend to change over time. For example, like if six months ago, you look at the market versus now you look at the market, also it's different, right? So we, we actually don't know, like it could slow down so much and then inflation could go up so much within just six six months, right? So market outlook will change um, like constantly, regularly. It, it will just keep changing. But when it comes to the allocation between equities and bonds, I think one thing uh, that you should look at is your current stage. Now. So if you are young, 25 years old, 30 years old, you have stock, a very small equity portfolio, you can be more aggressive, put more into equities. The reason is that if even you have a 30, 50% um, kind of crash, it won't kill you, right? Because your stock portfolio is still small and then you have you still have a, like, lot, a lot of earning power in the future. Whereas let's say if you are 65 years old, no longer working, and then you might want to put more into bond investment just to protect the capital, right? So it's really depending on the stage that where you are. It's not so much about the markets. Uh. So that's the only thing that I, w- I want to share on this. I, I can't really answer. It, it really depends on, on, your, uh, on your stage. Uh. So let's, let's say if, I mean, I don't know who asked this question. It's all anonymous. Uh, next time, please put your name uh, if possible. So next time, whoever asks these questions, right, if you can give some some more details like your age, then maybe we can discuss a little bit more. Uh, it's more like more tailored kind of response for your situations, right? And by the way, this is not financial advice, um, not licensed to do that. So this is just like uh, casual chatting. Don't treat this too seriously. Right? It's more for entertainment and education purpose. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that I th- th- this one I pulled up from a book. Uh, this book is called Stocks for the Long Run uh, by Jeremy Siegel. I think there's one video shared in the group not long ago. Uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel basically appeared on, I think, CNBC interview, and then he gave some uh, market kind of commentary. Lah. But he, he actually wrote a, a, wrote a very good book. I have, actually haven't read that, but I read like a first chapter already saw that, okay, there, there's good stuff here, right? So, you know, he's professor. He's not like 
full-time investor. I think he's a professor. So, so he tried to look things, uh, approach things from an uh, academic perspective. And those who approach things from an academic perspective, you will see that, you know, the moment they pull out data, they look at history, they are not looking at like five years, 10 years kind of uh, history, right? They are really looking at 200 years and tell us like what's, the, what's their um, insights from this, right? So you can see that, okay, just want to say, Property is not here, so I know that whenever whenever people comparing stocks, right, they they tend to bring up properties, and for property it's even harder because uh, I think you don't have like a single property index to to like kind of uh, uh do a comparison, right? But at least let's say for stocks, bonds, treasury bills, goals, we have long history to look at the the you know the performance over times. So over two hundred years, right, the total real returns. Real means that already adjusted for inflation. So if you want to know the total nominal returns, you should look at the table here and add the inflation. And inflation, I, I forgot how much for the 200 years period. It could probably around, let's say, 2% or, or let's say let's say 2%. Lah. So you can see that stocks perform like around, let's say, 8%-ish for 200 years period. So as long as you have a very long um, horizon, right? Say you are 30 years old, even 40 years old, right? You, you, you plan to live until, let's say, 90 years old, right? You still have, don't know, 40, 50 years ahead of you, right? So in that situation, stocks is like a no-brainer. Just invest in stocks and keep it for long term, you will be, you will be okay. Uh, all this, you know, like World War or whatever, like, you know, like all this inflation period uh, during the 1980s, all this is just like noise, uh, as long as you zoom out enough and look at long period of time now. Uh. So that's another takeaway that I want to share. Okay, so that's my commentary on these questions. Any any comment on it? All right, no comment. Let's move forward. Nvidia, what happened to my darling by the deep? <laughs> darling, let me see. YCX is not here, so I think I can't. Okay, usually when it comes to NVIDIA, I will just point to YCX. Hopefully next, actually he shared a lot now. If you follow, uh, I mean, the discussion in the chat group, right? Just read over all this discussion. There's a lot of insights in um, in 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 the discussion. So I think that that's uh, good enough for now. Actually, we don't have that much information also, but just read through the conversation. I think that's quite helpful already. Let me see what else do I have. Maybe I'll just comment a little can bit I, now. For, for, can, I, okay. can I say something? Because sure. I also just recently invested in NVIDIA, probably in February when it was 200. So I also lost a bit. Lah. But my interpretation is that because they were mixing up their crypto and gaming together and there was a crypto was crash and uh, revenues uh, really ran down quite a lot for the gaming sector. So the interpretation is that they were mixing it up too much and uh, they probably, if crypto doesn't have a good outlook, they won't have a good outlook uh, going forward um, because of that. That's the number one reason why I think it crashed previously. Um, I don't think the China issue is a big issue. That, that's my interpretation too. Yeah. Thanks. Uh... It's the typical Singaporean. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, actually, I, I totally agree with what you just said. Now. So that's why I, I was pulling out this um, this slide from coming from their uh, investor relation. So I think what you mentioned is the crypto, right? And I think specifically it's more on the Ethereum. I think Ethereum, they just like, okay, they plan to move to uh, proof of stake, right? So they have been talking about proof of stake for many years. And this round, it seems that they are really moving to the proof of stake. So the implication to the GPU uh, market is that now all this GPU card is not needed, at least for uh, Ethereum anymore. So there will be, you know, supply. When they can't use it for the for the mining purpose, I think all these miners, they will just um, offload. Of course, there are some other coins that will still use, uh, can, can be used to do minings. But uh, like you mentioned, right, the crypto market is already uh, in the winter. So there, there isn't so much uh, demand on the GPU. That's why there's huge slowdown in the GPU market. And aside from the GPU or, or this crypto, right, I think just looking at the PC markets, there's also some obvious slowdown uh, 
so so down lah. So I think when I read TSMC um like their you know their conference uh, quarterly conference call right um i think they also mentioned that okay the pc markets uh, is not doing that well there's some slowdown but they are quite optimistic because there's there's uh, enough demands coming from the ai uh, data center business uh. so so that one is still growing uh, nicely hence it's like helping to cushion the impact if you look at the semicon as a whole but if you look at the gaming sectors or the pc markets right which is this uh, top line here um, you can see that in, in one quarter, they dropped from 3.6 billion down to 2 billion. It's like almost 50% curve drop. So this is huge, right? So I totally agree with you. The price of NVIDIA dropped so much is more on this slowdown in, in the gaming uh, sector, in the crypt related to crypto, related to uh, PC market. This is a lot compared to the second one, which is the recent news uh, talking about like um, exporting chip to China, uh, uh, China. But I think this one, second one, fundamentally not as much, but what we are, I, I think at least what market is concerned about is that this might not def be the first things, you know, they just come up with this and then uh, maybe three months, six months down the road, they might be more restrictions that is coming up. And we still don't know how much, let's say, um, how much China side is going to retaliate, right? So if China retaliate and then US further retaliate and this one continue, so all this will really hit the sentiment uh, badly. La. So I think at least from the sentiment side, uh, there they will be some impact uh, from, from, uh, from this news. Anyone else want to comment or, or typical Singaporean, do you want to comment a little bit more? If not, we move on. I, I don't have much to, to talk about on, on NVIDIA, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Uh, if not, then if we move on. I saw that there's quite a number of questions. Might want to move a little bit past. If MS decide to ease the strengthening of the Sing dollar, will interest rate tend to rise or fall? Wow, this one very good question. But I think it's a bit hard to answer. I actually don't have a clear answer on this question. Um, the reason is that MS, right? They are different from Fed, they are different from ECB, they are different from Bank of Japan. All the uh, major economy in the world, right, they are controlling the monetary policy using interest rate. So they want to ease, they lower the interest rate down, they want to like tightening, they just uh, play around with the interest rate, they, they hide the interest rate. Whereas for Singapore, the interest rate is more like just the spillover effect, just the secondary effect. They, they, they don't control interest rate, right? So what happened is that they just control the exchange rate. So there's this basket of currency. If they want to tighten, they want to control inflation, they, they make SGD stronger. So they just control that and let the interest rate, uh, let the market just be the balancing items. Uh. But I think uh, if you, if whoever asking these questions, right, if you're, Question is more like we want to know whether uh, interest rate is going to up, uh, go up or down for specifically for the Singapore interest rate market, right? Um, it's very easy. You, I think in short, right, it has a very high correlation with uh, US in, uh, interest rate. So you, know, you see now US interest rate going up, right? Likely Singapore also go up. I think that's the easier way to understand it uh, because of the high correlation there. So let's say if you have any mortgage, uh, you want to be careful on that. Uh, if you can, let's say, uh, lock in a fixed rate, I think that will be great. Uh, um, just, yeah. So go ahead. So the couple, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we read about the how MES controls their exchange policy. So by weakening the Singapore dollar, they buttress against the interest rates increase. So that is what the Singapore government is currently doing, or not Singapore government, but the MES. They are purposely weakening the Singapore dollar so that the interest rates do not climb as fast as the US side. Um, and the reason is because by everyone is very confident in the Singapore dollar. They know that once the economy is a bit better, they will make the uh, Singapore dollar stronger. Then when the Singapore dollar is stronger, you also get appreciation in the exchange rate differences. So that's how they actually buttress against the interest rate increases. That, that's actually that's what MES is explaining it as by weakening the Singapore dollar. 
Yep. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, it's, I think it's a little bit like um the what do you call it uh, the interest rate or the exchange rate parity, right? So let's say like you say, uh, if uh, MAS already communicated that they will strengthen SGD by a lot, and then um, hence the interest rate side, it will be some there will be some some balancing now. If not, it becomes like an arbitrage, right? At the same time, you get a strengthening, and at the same time, you get a higher interest rate from Singapore. So it's usually not the case now. So the market will balance itself just because of that. But the interest rate market or the bond market is not explicitly controlled uh, in, in, in that sense. So just need to understand what, what is the driving factor. Uh. But I think, I, I don't know, like, I don't think, they need to see uh, like, uh, what was the main concern here, right? And then we can we can talk a bit more on 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 this. If the question is more on interest rate, I still think that uh, you should expect interest rate to rise, uh, Just because U.S. side, unless U.S. side the inflation cool down and then everything just pivot, then it's a different story. But looking at this uh, current projection, you just extrapolate, right? You need to be prepared of a higher interest rate, uh. Okay. Uh, let's move on. How to assess the chip for alliance problem on the on the whole semicon industry. Anyone has any good insight on this? Uh? I, I think this is not so easy. Uh. Let me see. Any, anyone want to want to try to give your view on, on this question? Okay, I, I'm not so prepared on these questions. I think it just came up this morning. But uh, I think right, this chips for alliance thing. Let me let me think. Uh, this is the one that asked for cooperation with uh, some with uh, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan and US, right? If I recall co correctly, but what US want to do here is that they just want to uh, like form an alliance and then just fight against uh, China. So what happened is that they will I don't know what specifically, but at least the the recent cheapest act, right? At least we can I, I can comment on that is that they try to give, give grants and then try to like um encourage all these uh, semicon companies to build fabs in US, but at least from free market perspective, this is not so good uh, because we all know that uh for US market if you build fabs there, the expenses is just so much higher than uh let's say just TSMC building fabs in uh Taiwan right, so there's no economy of scale there, so it's just like uh cost is so much higher. And they try to offset it via grants and then just want to make things more resilient. But actually, I, I'm always bearish on all these things, even though let's say some of these grants will go to TSMC, uh, even though I invested in TSMC, but I'm not bullish on that. The reason is that, you know, all these grants, I don't think it is like kind of permanent, right? It's not like every year the government will keep on putting money into TSMC pocket, right? It's more like just upfront some incentives and then after that, uh, what happens is that they have to operate the FAPs moving forward, right? So if the expense is higher, the cost in the later years is all absorbed by the TSMC, right? Uh, or they have to pass on all these uh, co higher costs to their customer. It's not good. And then, I mean, cost good, cost is high is really not good for everyone. Uh, we, we want what we want, at least uh, looking at it from a global perspective is that um, everyone just specialize in what they are doing the best, right? And then they can keep the cost low and hence everyone benefits from the lower cost, right? What we don't want is just that everyone, uh, all these big economies, they just want to make themselves more resilient. They try to do everything and then there's no scale and the cost is so much higher and it's not efficient. It's not good for, for the uh, corporates. Nah. So, but they, they do this is not really from... You know, this is not to make the companies earn more money, right? This is from a security perspective. They have no choice but to do it. Because let's say if something wrong with Taiwan Straits and then uh, China invade Taiwan and so on, suddenly they, they have no FAPs in Taiwan anymore. So that will be a huge uh, disruption uh, to US, right? So this is more for security reasons. Uh. So you see, I, I can understand why they want to do this. It's just that coming from a capitalist perspective, right? Uh, I'm not that bullish on all this uh, like political stuff that they try to pull off. Now. I'll stop here. Now. I, I don't know much, to be honest, on the exact, uh, all these like chips for what they try to do. I think it's not so clear cut one because, for example, even they ask uh, 
Korea to corporate, South Korea to corporate, right? They might not corporate fully also because they also have some business in China, right? So if they do too much, right? And then China force them to get out from China, I think uh, it's also bad for them, right? But it seems that now I think South Korea or Samsung specifically, they are stuck in between now. Even, even TSMC have some business in China as well. So uh, I think just be aware of that now. I'll stop here just to see anyone has any 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 comment. Okay, I'll stop here. Let's move on. Does anyone have any opinion on the luxury market like LVMH, especially in the upcoming recession everyone is talking about? I'm not looking at um a luxury market to be honest, but I know that um our friend I think SC is looking after looking into this market right so he's not here so i don't know about others um anyone have exposure in this market are, are you following their traction okay no then i have to skip uh, because i really have no insight at all so i'll skip here next one uh what are your opinions on snowflake and x prospect Okay, this questions came in early, so I have some time to do some preparation. Um, so actually, but this one is just pulled up from, uh, I think their latest earnings call. Now. So they have all these nice slides that we can look at. So for Snowflake, I have um, just to, for your, I mean, just for expectations, right? I have very small allocation into Snowflake. Uh, I actually bought it quite early when they just IPO. So my average cost is quite high. Um, I think they, they have a book on this. So if you want to understand the business, uh, there's one book that uh, detail a lot of details there. So you can read if you are interested. But Snowflake, I think it's just a very, very typical like growth company, growth story kind of uh, companies, right? So they are growing at very, very high percentage. You see like year over year, 106% growth. You know, when, when you have 100% growth, right, it's just like their revenue just double every year. So you can imagine that double, like let's say two years is already like four times higher, right? So if they are able to maintain a very high growth rate, right, these companies will be a lot larger, let's say three, five years down the road. But we shouldn't expect this kind of growth forever. It will slow down over time. This is uh, like for sure. As you can see here, it's 83%. It's still very high. That's why uh, I think in the uh, recent earnings, a uh, uh, recent investment result came up, right? I think their share price also uh, like positively uh, went up after the release. So for growth companies, easy one. What we are tracking is just the growth rate. Is If they are able to maintain the growth rate, even let's say their uh, expenses, as long as it doesn't go haywire, as long as they just maintain, right? I think they will be great. But for the growth rate, it's very important. Uh. So you can imagine if this number suddenly just grow that, go down to let's say 40%, right? then the share price will just crash. Lah. So just, just need to be careful on that. Lah. And as we see, there are quite a number of companies already seen their growth rate came, uh, came down and hence the stock price also didn't perform that well. So this is the expectations. Um, second thing is when we talk about the growth rate, right? I think for Snowflake, uh, the, the expectation of growth is, I think it's easier to, to like guess what will be the growth rate. Mainly it's because uh, their business, right? They actually charge based on usage. For example, they have, a, let's say, a three-year period with the customer. And then the customer uh, already have this Snowflake uh, uh, system or this soft software in, in, in the comp companies, right? And then they will use all this compute coming from uh, Snowflake, at least as an interface. But back end, they, they will still use like uh, AWS and, and so on now. So what happened is that they will use all this uh, compute and then based on the usage, right, the, uh, the, the bill will, will goes according to the, to the usage. If they use more, they pay more, something like that. So you can see that they, I mean, based on all this data, based on the customers, um, based on all these different trends, they can actually predict the growth rate uh, quite nicely, at least let's say for the coming three months, six months, 12 months. Uh, so, so it's not so difficult to predict. That's why we have some visibility when it comes to their growth rate uh in in uh, upcoming uh quarters now and the other things to look at is the retention rate so this retention rate is like they measure how much of the growth that coming from the existing customer and their net retention rate right is like 
is like fantastic. It's like 170% retention, right? Meaning that even if they don't secure like new customer, right? Just based on their existing customer alone, their business will still grow. It's not like the existing uh, customer, if they, if they don't renew and then uh, they will just like, you know, drop off and just get out and, and just look for other providers, right? So they are stuck with uh, Snowflake and then at the same time, they are using more, more and more of the, of the service and, and of the compute storage and so on. Hence, they are paying more. So at least that, that one gives some assurance or, or some, um, some assurance on their future uh, revenue growth. Now. So all this looks good. Uh, that's why share price is doing okay. But you know, if you talk about like since year to date, of course, share price dropped a lot, right? Be just because of the sold out in broad market. But at least for, for this uh, Snowflake, I think they, they, ha they have done relatively well compared to their peers in, in the uh, in SAS uh, sectors. Uh. Uh, so where's the bad part, right? The negative part. Okay. You know, now we talk about all this tightening and so on. So all this capital will not come free anymore. It will be become costly and costly. So let's say if the companies like Snowflake, right, they are still not turning a uh, positive net income, right? Let's say if they need to raise capital from the market, right, uh, the stock price will just tank because the, you know, the funding cost is a lot higher. Um, so that's why we need to look at the financial as well, right? To see whether first, are they making money or not? Uh, secondly, uh, if they are not making money, at least their cash flow, is it positive or not? So if you look at their financial, I think this one, if you want to look at more details, right? You can uh, watch the investor investor channel. I think that one, they, they detail it quite uh, uh, I, like more details compared to the commentary that I'm able to give here. So uh, recent quarter, 200 million, uh, 200 million losses. Uh, past six months, around 400 millions. So they are losing 200 millions every quarter. So this is not good. Uh, but the positive part is that out of that 200 million losses, right? Actually, oh, sorry, out of that 400 million losses in the past six months, right? So this is six months, right? Uh, the stock based compensation is like 380 millions. This stock based compensations, right? You, you know, this is like the, is a cost when it comes from a uh, net income perspective, but from cash flow perspective, this is actually like the shares given to the management, right? So it is not a cash outlay. So that's why when it comes to the cash flow from operating activities, they actually, they, they adjusted this uh, out. So if you just adjusted this one out, right? Forget about the rest, right? Actually, they are not, uh, yeah, their cash flow is kind of like neutral. So they don't have to raise capital if this one, assuming they are constant. Uh, of course, for this past six months, there are other stuff that is happening, uh, account receive, receivable. There's some positive here. Probably they have, um, like, like collecting more monies, right? That's why there's some positive cash inflow here. So I think they can, they are able to sustain this. Um, no concern on they have they have to raise capital, so I think the next thing to watch is just that as long as they are able to continue to as uh, execute and then uh, the revenue growth going nicely, I think this one will work out well. Now. But you know, growth slow down this one sometimes very hard to predict one. Like I say, if suddenly if suddenly the big drop to twenty percent or even fifty percent rise, uh, then stock price also will drop one because their valuations right is still very very high. And those valuations really count on all this high growth rate that's been projected for the coming years. Now. So that's one thing to watch. And of course, this one, uh, if you look at their gross profits, they grow like quite high, right? Like almost double their gross profits. But if you look at this, their expenses also going up a lot. So if expenses going up, meaning that their net income is not going to turn positive for us. So, so I think this is also something to watch out. Basically, the growth rate and then how good are they at controlling their cost? I think someone asked them on like, uh, when it comes to the cost, right? What are they spending money on? I think the management give the answer that they actually spend a lot uh, when it comes to uh, marketing stuff. So meaning that they, they really go full force uh, when it comes to like growing their business and not so much about controlling uh, cost control. So I think this is just a couple of insight. Uh, I think whoever asked these questions, right? I think next time, if you guys ask slightly early, if I am able to prov uh, provide, I can give more commentary. If not, like, you know, just random answer. I can't comment that much. Uh. I'll stop here uh, just to see. I think Gavin is here, right? Just now, early morning, he's here. Uh, oh, 
Kevin, if you want to comment anything or anyone else want to comment, I'll just stop here just to, to see anyone want to contribute. Okay, I think no one want to add. <laughs> All right, I'll just stop here. Okay, the next one. Most AMD financial analyst day and it seems like AMD is really catching up to NVIDIA or Intel in terms of their GPU or CPU. Thoughts? Hmm. Honestly, I haven't looked into AMD that closely. At least for the GPU, I don't think AMD is catching up. At least if you look at the market share, I think the video is still dominating. So I, I actually don't know whether like AMD is doing so much better compared to Nvidia, at least for the GPU markets. Uh. Maybe later I can look at the data again to confirm that. Uh, and for the CPU, AMD versus Intel, I think it's very obvious. Like the, the, the one that recently came up, right? The Zen 4 is really good. And then in terms of pricing, they are really aggressive when it comes to pricing, right? So we still don't know what Intel will come up uh, in the upcoming one. I think it should be soon, right? So we, we can't compare uh, the current offerings of AMD versus the old offerings of Intel, right? It's not fair. But let's wait for the Intel one. Uh, let's see what they can come up with. And then uh, we can compare their performance and then also look at their pricing strategy, right? But for the, I think for the Zen 4 one, the one that I surprised the most is really their pricing. I think when it comes to product, uh, the quality of the product, right? Their, their CPUs, right? I think there's no doubt about it. It's really, really good. Even Zen 3 itself is already like quite good, right? And Zen 4, there's further improvement. And if you just look at that, Intel is really lagged behind. So, and if MD is already better than Intel and then they are going aggressive, right? They are pricing it, their product, like not excessive kind of price, right? I think it's really, really big trouble for Intel. I think this is true for their, um, you know, like CPU, the retail market, and also the data center business. So I think for Intel, even though they are like, you know, the value picks, right? Their, their earnings, their PE ratio is so low, but this is just not a company that you like want to buy. Um, un unless you have a clear visibility that their upcoming uh in terms of their roadmap, right, they are able to come up with good products over the coming, let's say, one year or so. But at least for the for the upcoming one, I don't think so. That's why if you look at the share price, also quite weak. I think all this is uh, like like pricing to a certain extent, but I, I, I'm not going into Intel. Just just looking at how aggressive AMD is. Okay, that's my comment. I haven't looked at AMD in details. So I don't want to comment too much. Anyone else want to comment on this? All right. Next one, any other possible sectors that might recover earlier than the tech stocks? Hmm. Anyone want to want to give some opinion on this? Mr. Typical Singaporean, what are you how, how do you position your, you know, like the tactical or or medium or short term portfolio? Sorry, I'm driving right now, so I can't speak. All right, all right. Uh, okay, then please uh, drive carefully. <laughs> I think I will, I will just skip this question as well. I, you know, sometimes, all, like how to say, uh, like looking at sectors and try to guess which, which sector is doing uh, better compared to the rest. I think sometimes not so easy, I think. Because this is not so much about like... Um, like now we are at a cyclical downward and we are going upward and the hence you want to position uh, your sector allocations, right? I think this one, sometimes it's not that easy one because every period, right? If you look at like every six months, you just pay attention to the narrative, right? It changed over time one. It's not like every time there's up cycle and then for sure certain sector will benefit. Of course, there are some some pattern there that you can uh, just look at history and comment on that, right? I think that is true. And and of course, there are people who like to paint story out of this, right? But if you look at in details, right? Every time the, the narrative is different one. For example, if you look at the past, let's say three months or even six months, right? We are talking about oil now because of all this uh, oil price going up and then Ukraine, Russia crisis, and then, you know, Russia stopped the uh, gas pipeline. And then there's some concern when it comes to the uh, supply shortage. And, and this when the, all this narrative, all this story come up like very convincing, right? Traders will just 
pump into all these um, sector like oil sector they will just buy and then all these trader they are also quite smart one they will have all these risk uh, trading strategy they will just say okay once the like moving average cross certain level uh, then they will just get out right then whoever go long term on oil sectors they will just become the back holders la. so no, no choice about it la. so if you want to play tactical and use tactical to go in you must go up using the same tactical kind of um, uh, uh, insights uh, or, or some all these indicators. Uh. So in this channel, at least we are more like concerning on the fundamentals or on the long-term uh, kind of outlook, right? So I think if you play sectors, um, just need to be aware of that, whether, you know, all this is sustainable or not. Uh. At least for me, right? I think that, you know, all this narrative when it comes to like, especially oil, um, I'm not that bullish. Uh. It's just because like all this money pour into the sectors, it actually lower down the funding costs or, or, or the cost of capital in the oil sectors, right? All this will actually spur some investment that actually will help out in the energy, um, let's say over the next three years and five years, right? It might not be necessary all this carbon-based uh, energy, for example, like uh, crude oil, but let's say there will be money that put into nuclear or wind or solar. All this will also increase the output in the future, right? So the energy as a whole, sometimes I think uh, it might not be a good long-term uh, investment just because of the capex and also uh, current high prices doesn't mean that all these high prices, right, will just escalate for three, five, seven years in the future, right? It might be a a, a long term from for, for the traders, for example, like one to two year kind of horizon, it could still go up, right, which is good for traders. They can ride a trend for three months, six months, 12 months, it's really, really a good trade already. They will just pocket the profit and they, ju they will just go, uh, go away when the downturns come, right? But whoever want to like have uh, investment that you say, okay, I'm going to invest, I'm going to hold two years, three years, five years, right, then you might want to avoid this kind of uh, sectors that is not so, um, you know, don't have, it's not so sustainable one. Now. So I think that's all on this. Uh, don't want to comment so much. Too vague already, I think. Anyone else want to comment on that? Anyone suddenly talk about energy or wanted to invest in energy or some technical sector can also comment. All right, if not, next, the last question is open to all. Please share your biggest mistake in 2022 and lesson learned. I will pass around first, see who want to answer this. Who want to go first? Or oh, everyone just listening in, uh, tune in, just treat this uh, TCS as like a radio channel. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a form of welcoming you back to, to this. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot, Martin. Martin, you want to share a bit on, on this? Do you have anything to share? Any Not just mistake. Lah. Let's say I, I, I make this become wider. Let's say, do you have any like mistake or any success uh, that you want to share? Or any, any things that you've learned in the past, let's say, uh, like year to date, uh, like this year? Anything, any takeaway, any insights? I mean, for me, I think, uh, yeah, so I think the main takeaway is... Uh, you, you really have to build conviction on your own when it comes to investing. La. Try not to, try to tune out a lot of the, or a lot of the, like what you mentioned, right? I like the word narrative. La. Narratives are painted by a lot of people. But whether if it's really against or for your conviction, or it's, it's, it's another subject on its own. La. So, so, so please access, I mean, the main lesson I feel my personal takeaway, right, is really be data driven in, when it comes to investing. Yeah. And, uh, just like I think there's one good example about why ODs, S&P are not upgrading investment, why not upgrading Tesla as an investment grade uh, stock, right? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous because I feel that there was some injected personal bias by the ratings agency. So so this is a very good example where uh, buyers can cloud your judgment when it comes to um, making investment decisions. Uh, so, so personally, that's my main thing. And, and try not to listen to too much of this bull case, bear case, uh, in social media, it's, it, you have to take it with a pinch of salt uh, and, and just be data driven. Uh, that, that's my personal takeaway. Yeah, totally agree with you. I think, uh, yes, I mean, for those who 
don't invest using like really go to fundamental level and look at the data themselves, right? Uh, especially those who just like reading investment articles and stay on the surface. Sometimes it's really hard because if I think for those who dig into like data, they will know, right? If you just like, let's say you pull up like some financial data, just look at the data. Sometimes it's just like, wow, so many numbers. And then after you look at the numbers, you uh, like just let's say after one hour you just forget about the numbers because the numbers right they are just like numbers they don't turn into insights or then they don't turn into anything that is actionable by itself you know they are just data and sometimes if we look at the data of course if we already have a good understanding on what's happening we have some some let's say some uh narrative that is playing in our head right the narrative that we created ourselves right uh if you don't have that you just look at the plain data sometimes the data itself is just like very noisy and very hard to make sense of it. Uh. But if you read financial news, right, one good thing is that you will think that, oh, oh this one makes sense, that one makes sense. It's because someone, uh, that person could have some, let's say, some, some, uh, some intention to lead you or mislead you, we don't know, right? Or, or he, he or she already have some story to tell and then he just look at some data to try to justify uh, the argument that he's trying to make, right? So they will make all this story and, and write an article or even create a YouTube videos, right? For YouTubers, I don't know. <laughs> so, so once they do that, right? Whoever listening, right? They will just, ah, oh, okay, uh, that's a very nice story. Yeah, yeah, that's the story, right? Okay, makes sense already. Then they thought that they understand it, but they don't know like, okay, how biased it is, right? Right? Because whatever story that you're listening into, whether it's backed by data or not, right, the data itself could be biased. You could have data that is totally against the narrative, but he just don't want to share it because it will make the story so much like uh, shaky, right? So he would just hide something and then just point to something that he wanted to show you. So I think that's, t I totally agree with you. Whoever what, doing all this investment on themselves, right? You, you should really pull out the data yourself, look at it, and then just be objective about it rather than uh, like try to believe into other people's story. Because when you count on other people's story, right? And then what, what if their story change, right? Do you just like shift together or or you kind of like already have this uh, mindset that you, you want to believe it, hence you force yourself to believe it. So I think that one is also something to to be aware of. Uh, I think our mind is always biased, you know? So this is something to, to work on. And I just want to comment a little bit on the Tesla story. I, I don't know, I actually don't know who, um, like, I think there's, there's this uh, lady uh, on Twitter, right? She do a very comprehensive study comparing uh, Tesla versus other um, automakers and say that how come Tesla financial strength is so much higher and the rest actually uh, are not doing, uh, the, the rest, right? Like for example, like Ford, their financial is so much weaker and, and they are able to get investment grade, but Tesla don't have an investment grade, right? I don't know why, like, okay, the study itself, okay, I have to give credit, it's very uh, comprehensive. And those those metrics is really like the metrics that um, rating agency look at whenever they try to score a bond offerings from a company. And then she even have this, uh, like, a, 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 like a picture showing Apple share price before uh, they turn into investment grade, right? I mean, during the period, they are like uh, not investment grade, then, then then it got an investment grade and the share price just shoot upward, right? It seems that she's trying to to, to, to paint a narrative that you see Apple in the past, uh, it is like uh, junk rated, like non-investment grade and it become investment grade and then the share price just shoot up. And hence for Tesla, now it's not investment grade and she think that it should be investment grade and hence the share price will go up. So I, I think that's the like the kind of implicit narrative that uh, is painted at least for that message. But I want to point out something is that you know Apple right uh, from I think around two thousand three uh, to two thousand thirteen they don't even have long term bonds you know during that period let's say prior to two thousand three they have some long term bonds and then their rating is truly uh, speculative or non investment grade and to be fair at that time right Apple is just like one of many startup. Uh, they are tech companies, I think together with other, like even Microsoft, they are not so big, right, in 2003, before 2003. So it is understandable that during that period, they are not very, like, don't have a consistent uh, net income from year to year. Of course, non-investment grade is, like, understandable. 
But from 2003 to 2013, although during that period, iPhone was launched and then even like iPhone and second generation and third generation already launched for a couple of years, they are selling well, revenue come, uh, revenue is growing healthily, their net income is growing healthily uh, during that period. But there's no rating or, or no upgrade in the rating. The reason is that there's nothing to rate, right? Because Apple is not like it's not like they are they are issuing new bonds. So they don't even have bonds that is long term bonds to be rated, right? Hence if you try to paint a picture that oh they only got a investment grade in 2013, I mean technically it is true. But you need to understand that they got it in 2013 also because they have they, they just uh, issued uh, like a 17 billion dollars of uh, long term bonds in 2013, and they issue it, and they of course they want to issue huge uh, uh, quantity of bonds. They they will get the uh, rating agency to rate on it because that will determine whether you know all these bond funds are able to invest uh, into into the bonds or not. So of course. 2013, they get the rating, right, which is a high rating. But prior to that, right, they already have a good cash flow. They are, they are like accumulated a uh, huge amount of cash until like uh, Carl Icahn say, okay, there's enough, too much cash already. And the PE or the valuation of the company is so low. Uh, hence, he's trying to convince uh, Tim Cook to uh, like do all this share buyback. And hence, they do this, right? Yeah, and, and for those who, who didn't know the story uh, during that time is that they have a lot of cash sitting overseas. If they bring in into US, right, they will have to pay uh, like a hefty amount of tax. So what happened is that they say, okay, the cash, they will continue to park uh, overseas. They just issue bonds uh, in, uh, in in the local markets and just use the proceeds to to buy uh, buy back their own shares. Now. So all this uh, share buyback actually started uh, since twenty, I think twenty twelve or twenty thirteen um, onwards, and they have been increasing the share buyback since then. Now. So I think that that one you really need to understand Apple story and and not just fully trust you know all this uh, narrative that painted by by others. Now. And for Tesla specifically, I would say that they are not issuing bonds, at least for now. They are not issuing. They have a positive cash inflow. They have been using all this cash inflow uh, to pay down their debt. So they are doing that. It's a bit similar to the period of uh, Apple, let's say between 2008 to 2012, that period. So there's no point to, to discuss all this about like uh, credit rating and so on, because it is just not relevant, you know. First, they are not issuing, not issuing bonds, and then for the credit rating agency, why would they so eager to update all this? Uh, usually, they okay for rating agency, right? They they will have incentive to downgrade bonds and not upgrade bonds. The reason is because now all these bonds, right, is already traded. Uh, if there's any, right, is already traded uh, in the markets, right? So let's say the company's uh, performance, their their fundamental is is improving, right? Why would they so eager go and upgrade their, their bonds, right? They would rather just keep it there. And let's say if the company want to issue bonds, then only they say, okay, if you want to issue bonds, you talk to me, I will do another round of fresh update. And then basically I can give you a, a good rating and you pay me fee, right? So that's how that is something incentivize them to do a refresh, right? If not, they will just keep it status quo and give some excuse to say, oh, because of all this, they don't have enough models, only model three, uh, hence they don't, uh, they, they don't want to do an upgrade, right? So all this is just excuses, uh, I would say. And, but then on the other side, if the company fundamentals is going downward, right, they will have an incentive because they don't want a company that, let's say, they have a double B rating and then suddenly they're just like, like, um, the bankrupt, right? This one looks very badly, if, at least for the rating agency, because you see, you, you didn't upgrade your, uh, you didn't update your rating. Suddenly the company just up, uh, just bankrupt, right? They don't want to, to, to have, have that, right? So they wanted to see that, okay, if the company's, uh, situation is become poorer and poorer, the, the risk of bankruptcy getting higher, right? So from double B, they will just downgrade it to single B and then they will just down, downgrade to triple C. What they want to, to do is that for any companies that is bankrupt, right? Hopefully they will already downgrade them to like, let's say triple C, like even six months ahead, right? 
so that they can say, you, okay, you see, on, only companies that having low rating uh, given by us will bankrupt. Those that we, we rated them even at a double B, you see, not many of them bankrupt, right? So, so this is their incentives, right? You just need to understand all these rating agencies, they have their incentive. Uh, it is really to their, to their advantage not to do a fresh update and, and just like, okay, just say the score, right? Yeah. So, so at least that's my take on, on this entire, uh, Tesla rating kind of topics. Uh, you just need to understand that credit rating is referring to the bond. It's nothing to do with the equity. So, so if you are investing in Tesla equity, right, don't pay so much attention to, to their bond ratings. Uh, this is, uh, first takeaway. Second takeaway is just that, uh, all this rating downgrade upgrade is not so relevant now because their uh, Tesla fundamental has been, uh, has been improving. And at the same time, credit rating agency, they don't have so much incentive to do all this like fresh update. Nah. So, so my, my, just my takeaway is just, uh, that, nah. so just want to share because I, I'm getting a little bit, uh, frustrated on like, why so many people pay attention to this kind of thing, which I think is like not important. I, I the, the way I see is it is very similar to like the stock split, nah. like the like three to one split. Of course, people get excited about it. Of course, there's some, uh, let's say some, some positive signaling to say, okay, company has been doing well when they do stock split. And let's say if, let's say if they upgrade, right? It's always a, a helpful one. It is not going to be negative. It's just that it is not a significant thing. It's just like, it is more like a irrelevant things. Now. Yeah. So, so that's my take on this. Okay. Uh, I'll stop here with the, keep, I don't want to keep ranting for, for too long. Oh, I see, I see that, uh, I, I suppose I think people need to have a, a better or rather in, uh, interpretation that the ratings uh, are completely irrelevant when it comes to it comes to BS. Actually, this is something that I didn't realize. Yeah, so, because as I was reading, right, I mean, I'm just trying to digest the info. So, I mean, I didn't pay that too much attention to it because I honestly, uh, I don't really look at ratings. It's just that that, that, that piece of, uh, you know, those videos and all these uh, created a buzz. Uh, so, that led me to also get read up, okay, what's the significance of uh, rating changes? Then now, now that you mentioned that actually they, they don't have a lot of incentives to do that and they do it quite infrequently, it seems. So, yeah, honestly, probably we shouldn't pay much attention to it. Yeah, and, and, and fundamentally just fall back on uh, your personal conviction and try to also, you know, look at the bears. And just my, again, also, it's just another lesson that I learned this year, right? Try to look at the bear case also, like why are they thinking this way? And then you make your own, uh, judgment that okay whether they are the bad case also makes sense right? so that you can position accordingly you know like try not to all in you know and listen that like, oh this is very good uh, everybody everybody should all in and all that. that that's not supposed to be the way we mess so and you know diversification is a fundamental so so just just and that that's my main personal takeaway as a new relatively new uh, uh investor myself Yep. Thanks a lot for the comment, Martin. Anyone else want to like, uh, share on this? Come back to this, like, biggest mistake or any things that you have learned, uh, since beginning of the year? Anyone want to contribute on this? Yeah. I think if no, I think we'll keep, uh, we'll close the call soon. Uh, but before that, just for myself, I, um, I think for me, right, the biggest mistake, um, is just that need to be more, how to say, uh, how to be, just need to be looking at valuation more uh, because I think uh, over the past, let's say one year, there are companies that I bought, let's say I thought that, okay, let's put $2,000 into one uh, companies and just uh, just have some exposure in there so that it will encourage me to look into more details and follow the companies closely, right? So there are a number of companies uh, belong to that categories that uh, since then, I've seen that, okay, the broad market is slowing down and then their fundamentals, their growth also slow down. And hence we are seeing like, you know, so, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent kind of drop, right? So when a company can drop 80 percent, doesn't matter, you just put in, let's say like $2,000, it, it still translates to like a losses that is quite big. It's not like 
you know, like $500, it could lose all, right? If you put $2,000 there, if lost uh, 80%, it's still $1,600, right? This is not insignificant amount, right? Uh, I mean, this money actually could be saved, let's say, if I am more like discipline when it comes to the valuations uh, and, and not just treat that, okay, it's just 2000 I can just buy here and there and just accumulate over time, right? So, and, and I can see that my uh, conviction on these companies also uh, is shaky. Uh, I, I know that, right? But the moment I, okay, when I bought it, actually, I didn't realize that that much. But, you know, you, you, you will test your conviction when the stock price coming down and then the, and then the fundamentals also deteriorating and you know that whether you are truly uh, have high convictions, right? There are still companies that drop by 60, 70, 80% that I I haven't really like averaged down because actually the, there isn't much conviction there. That's one thing. Second thing is that they haven't been performed that well uh, on fundamental basis. Though. So I think this is something that I should learn, uh, which is be more disciplined. Uh. So, okay, this is uh, just a quick sharing for me on this. Uh, just before we close the call, anyone else just want to like have a chat? Um, yeah, I'll just stop here just for 20 seconds. See anyone want to share anything or not? If not, we just close today's call. All right. Um, then I see no one else. Maybe I, I know uh, there are some of them quite active one. It's just that, you know, uh, sometimes during weekend might be listening to the to the TCSS session while doing something else, right? Not convenient. I that is understood. <laughs> um, okay, I think thank you so much. Uh, you know, this is like uh, after four months haven't done this, right? So uh, you know, this is our first call after the break and we have like 10, 10 plus people uh, that dialing in. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, thanks a lot for the encouragement uh, when when I stop doing all this YouTube and make a comeback, I see there's a lot of positive encouragement. Uh. You know, I mean, uh, within this YouTube scenes, right? I, I know that, you know, there are, there are not, not everything is positive, right? You know, there are situation like, you know, for example, hold or not uh, already collapsed during this period. There are some, um, blaming some, some YouTubers, some, some people say that YouTubers shouldn't recommend this and that. Um, and then, I think there are a group of people that have very negative kind of perception to um, uh, YouTubers or, you know, financial influencer and so on, right? Technically speaking, I'm creating videos. I'm also one of this, this group of people. But I have to say, since I started all this YouTube, right, I haven't received like, you know, like a very negative kind of comment, even companies that I talked about in the past, right? So for example, uh, Meituan, I talked about this company in the past. There are a number of companies that, that I mentioned in my channel for, at least for, for some people, they will see this as like, uh, okay, this is like a promotion, right? You, you try to promote these companies and then the share price didn't perform well. Even TSMC also dropped, right? Even for myself, uh, my TSMC is in the red, even though I have like DCA for like a period of time, right? So for those who like listen to the show and, and be bullish on companies like this and now making losses, right? Uh, I think there are people like that. Um, um, make losses. It's just that so far I haven't received any like negative comments, right? So I, I really thanks a lot for all the support, uh, in the past. And, and actually that's also the reason why I try to like, uh, come back and try to like contribute to, to the, to the community. Lah. So, okay. I think that's all for, from, from me. Thanks a lot for all the encouragement. Hope that we can do this, um, on more consistent basis. Lah. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep up the good work and uh, and and you know, be believe what do what you believe is right, and and I'm sure the the uh, the support and the encouragement will, will will be there so that then they, they can create better content for to improve our literacy on investing because I think this is something very underrated among the millennials like they don't know the people don't know the importance of them and. Uh, it's, it's good that people like yourself to step up and contribute to to ideas. Uh, uh, of course, I just need to say disclaimers and all this. That this is just purely your own opinion, right? And I think the, the, the spreading of the financial literacy is, is quite important, especially in times like this. Yep, totally agree. So keep up. 
<laughs> yeah, hope that we all, not just me, uh, I hope that this is not a solo effort. Uh, we, we all know, right? I mean, for those who, who are with the community for some time, you know, there are uh, a number of great contributors also. It's not just a solo work, right? So I also want to thank uh, uh, all of them. Uh, in the future sessions, let's say if I'm able to get anyone on the show and like just host the session together, I think that will be a lot more interactive. So yeah, hope we will do that. Uh, in the coming weeks. All right. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Uh, let's stop here and see you in the next one. All right. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.